Looked like a priest or a vicar or something. And I'm about to bless you with some wrestling nostalgia. That's right, everyone. I think I speak for all of us when I say that WrestleMania is the best. We all love WrestleMania with its history and its tradition and its WrestleMania moments, trademark. But at the same time, I think we can all agree that it really draws in the filthy casuals, doesn't it? Those fair weather casual fans all flocking in when it suits them to watch the big shiny marquee matches. They're not down in the wrestling trenches with us. Three hours of Raw every week, two hours of SmackDown, NXT as well if, if you're a bit if you're a bit crazy. They don't see all of the failed storylines, all of the abandoned gimmicks. They're not here with us week in, week out. I'm talking to you, Ariel Helwani. Yes, WrestleMania draws in a pretty hefty chunk of the audience who aren't watching week in and week out. And in 2008, WWE had a very cunning plan to try and exploit this by marketing a role in the build-up to WrestleMania as WrestleMania Rewind. -na -na -na. The idea, a normal episode of Raw, except all of the matches in theory, We'll get to that in a second. Our big WrestleMania rematches from WrestleMania cards of the past. Uh, it, they didn't stick to it fully, but it did result in a quite weird episode of Monday Night Raw, and that's why we're here. So Luke, if you will, please hit the intro. Oh, no, 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 never mind, never mind, never mind. Don't leave that. <laughs> you can leave that bit in if you want. Well, I was, I'll, what I was trying to do there was to start singing the theme tune, the whoa, I'll never give in, I just wanna be, wanna be low. That's what I was, that was fine. I don't know what that first attempt was about. It's March 10th, 2008, and we are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A city heavily influenced by German immigrants in the 19th century, and one which continues to be a center for German-American culture, specifically well known for its brewing industry. Whoa, brewing beers, all the lads, all the beers. Lads, 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 lads. It's a, it's actually an energy drink. Ric Flair comes out to open the show and it's a bit like watching one of those nature documentaries about a natural disaster where it just shows a normal village or a normal street or whatever, but you know that we are moments before catastrophe strikes. And that's because we know that old Richard is set to lose to Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 24 and retire from the business forever. Yes. Flair calls out HBK and says to him, look, in my experience, in this business, this business, the words sympathy and pity do not exist. And if I can't hang with you at WrestleMania, and if I can't beat you, then I don't even want to carry on wrestling anymore. Maybe it's right that I retire forever. It's, it's not getting any easier to say that. Flair then gets all hyped up and goes, oh, I'm the nature boy, woo, and all this sort of stuff. The crowd are really enjoying it. He says, you know what? Maybe at WrestleMania, I have a good day and I beat you, Shawn Michaels, and maybe then my career can go on forever. And <laughs> when he says that, I feel like a bit of the real Flair is slipping out because you can tell that there's a glint in his eye. With a glint in his eye, he really wants that to be true. He does want his career to continue forever. And as we know, he would go on to give it quite a decent attempt. It's also worth noting the, it's not even like a purple shade that Flair turns in this promo. <laughs> like he's so tanned and so angry that he goes like a deep, earthy, red, like a healthy, natural, earthy burgundy. And it, oh, it's just magnificent. Michael says the sort of thing you'd expect him to say. He says, you know, whether you be me or I be you, we're definitely gonna steal the show. And then they shake hands and, you know, it's all, it's, it's face versus face. But they are interrupted by, hey, nothing you can say. It's WWE Champion, Randall, Randall, Keith Orton. He's getting ready for a triple threat title defense at Mania against both John Cena and Triple H. And part of the buildup to that is the Raw Triple Threat Takeover, which means that over over the course of three weeks, one of the competitors in the triple threat match will be in charge of one week of Raw, then the next one, then the next one. We're in the middle of the three weeks here, and this is Randall's week. Randy Orton in charge, hold on to your hats, everyone, because it's about to be a party in here, isn't it? That fun-loving viper. He books Triple H versus Kane, a rematch from WrestleMania 15. He also books a rematch of the main event of the previous year's WrestleMania, John Cena versus Shawn Michaels. Randy, you are spoiling us, you beloved babyface, you. That's not right. 
Imagine if Randy just turns out to be the best booker in the world. Imagine, like, if he, from this episode, gets a sudden boost of confidence and thinks, I'm really good at putting together matches, actually. And he heads off to Dragon Gate and takes the helm and leads them past New Japan and dominates the Japanese wrestling world. I want to see Randy Orton, Japan's greatest ever booker. I want that to be real now in my head. But it can't be. That segment ends and the opening match of the show begins. The opening match of tonight is another WrestleMania rematch. It's just casually thrown out there. Undertaker versus Mark Henry with the casket match stipulation as well. Can Undertaker possibly survive? Yes. They go back and forth. Uh, Taker's dominating at first, but then Mark Henry works his way back into it and nails the big splash. And then he goes to roll Taker into the casket, but uh-oh, Hell's Gate! <laughs> what am I doing with my hands there? And it's the most devastating, quick-acting Hell's Gate I've ever seen. Henry's like out straight away, bleeding from the mouth. He's just totally limp on the canvas. Taker rolls him in, shuts the lid, and Undertaker wins the casket match. Hit the thing, Luke, because it's a casket match squash. Casket match squash, casket match squash. Thought it was a long match, you're a damn fool. I'll be honest with you, there was no... I hadn't planned any, not that you can tell, I hadn't planned a song there, and Luke hadn't planned a thing either. I think I've taken him by surprise. I can just picture the comments now, by the way, like, a lot of singing in this one. He sang too much. That'll be the end of the singing, don't worry. I think. <laughs> I'm worried I've put loads more singing in. Taker would obviously go on to not only main event WrestleMania in a couple of weeks' time, but also beat Edge for that World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, a really good main event of WrestleMania, but now it's time to carry on with Raw, because next up is, is one of the greatest vignettes I've ever seen. Carlito is chilling in a Florida resort with Maria. He calls Florida the most beautiful place in the world. Now, I've been to Florida and I did enjoy it, but at the same time, I've also been on the internet. And I know that a lot of Americans, in fact, do not see Florida as the most beautiful place in the world. So make up your own mind. Carlito is talking to Maria, who until recently in storyline has been in a relationship with Santino Morella, and he's saying, oh, his fake accent, and I just hate him, and I can't believe you fought for his crap, Maria. And <laughs> he doesn't do that. And yet, I don't know whether this was just filmed before they'd broken up in the storyline. I can't tell whether they're together or not now, because Maria's acting like Santino is still her boyfriend, and she's trying to, like, like roll her eyes at Carlito's advances, basically. He continues to try to seduce Maria, Carlito this is, but instead, every time he does, his attempts are thwarted by seagulls just flying in. <laughs> Sounds like I'm making it up, but no, look, seagulls flying in and just pinging him, pinging him in the face, pinging. Eventually, one particularly brave seagull flies in, just knocks him off his chair, and he gets up, and the seagulls clamp to his nose, and what follows is, honestly, one of the best fights I've ever seen. Carlito starts, like, <laughs> ramming it into the table, like, it's very graphic, he's like, Ugh, damn it, Ugh. We get a super cut of a bit where he's like, it's on his nose, then it's on his lip, then it's on his ear, he's like, every time he's like, oh, oh, <laughs> really selling it well. Oh, at one point, he throws the seagull on the floor, gets on top, and just starts laying in the ground and pound, and feathers are flying up and I'm like this is amazing but what's actually the point of this segment and then it goes order Wrestlemania 24 now <laughs> I'm like whoa it was just an advert for Wrestlemania and I am sold I'm contacting my local pay-per-view provider as we speak and one last bit of comedy genius just to round off this honestly really funny segment is just at the end Carly Doe's sat there with Maria the fight's over his hair is just full of feathers and he goes so as I was saying and then a seagull just craps on it <laughs> It's simple, but undeniably effective. Backstage we go now, and who's there but only boxing great Floyd Mayweather and the money team, his entourage, who consists of, like, only his biggest of friends. They're all actually around, like, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, but it's just that Floyd's so small that he makes them look... Why am I calling out Floyd Mayweather? What am I doing? Ooh, what's he gonna do? Lightly jab me for 12 rounds and win a decision. Stop, what am I doing? Floyd's here because he's got the way in for his match against Big Show at WrestleMania, which if you remember rightly, was probably like one of the best celebrity wrestling matches in WWE history at the time, before all celebrities just like magically became good at wrestling. What? I still don't understand what, what's going on. We'll get back to Floyd and Big Show later on in the night, but now it's time for a match of two very unconvincing blonde men. Finley and the home state boy, Wisconsin's own Mr. Kennedy. Kennedy. This is also billed as another WrestleMania rematch, and I'm like, was it? And then it turns out, no, they were just both once in the same Money in the Bank ladder match. I don't buy that. 
I don't think that counts at all, WWE. Before the match, JBL appears on the Tron. He is feuding with Finley because he, he just keeps beating up Finley's son, Hornswoggle. I interviewed Hornswoggle once and he didn't mention this and you'd think it would really have traumatized him, but he's fine. He, he actually, he definitely was the alpha dog in our conversation and mocked me somewhat. It's not a long promo from JBL on the Tron. He basically just says, oh, I've heard you want our match at Mania to be a Belfast brawl with no DQ. Well, at least that means I can put you in hospital right next to your pathetic little son. Finley's really angry about this and he's trembling with rage before the bell rings and he just can't contain it any longer. He just loves to fight and protect his loved ones. And he just goes, Wah! and just batters Kennedy again and again with the shillelagh. The ref calls for the DQ. Kennedy wins. But really not. In fact, just to drive home the point that Vince never likes someone to win when they are local to the area that the show is taking place in, Kennedy gets helped up the ramp by referees. And Finley, <laughs> Finley follows him and goes, <laughs> and just continue. Just a few more shots with the shit, Eddie, just to really make Mr. Kennedy look like a pathetic man. JBL and Finley would go on to have a short but very entertaining match at WrestleMania to open the show. Uh, my main memory of it, I think, is one of them just launching a bin at the other hard. And I think, yeah, it was good. It was a good match. Can you see the writings on the wall? That, that's the last bit of singing, I think. It's IC champion, Jeffrey Nero Hardy. And on commentary, Jim Ross is like, this match is not a WrestleMania rewind match, actually, ladies and gentlemen. I'm like, of course it's not. The last one wasn't either, Jim. Stop it. There's real messy intensity to the start of this match, to the point where I'm like, they're actually, like during the opening lockup, they're actually trying to throw each other to the canvas. It looks real. It looks very real. Either I'm just a pathetic mark, or there was an argument backstage before this match. That's genuinely what it seems like, but I can't think what Jericho and Jeff would argue over. Maybe whether music was better in the 80s or the 90s. I'll let you work out which one's which. Jericho's the 80s. But yeah, they're dragging each other around the ring, they're falling over, they're getting back up, there's little, ooh, little slappy slaps to the face. I'm like, they, yeah, something's gone on here. After a little while, they settle down and start having a normal match with like moves and stuff. Jeff kicks out of the lion salt, hits the twist of fate and peels off his top and the crowd all go, oh my God, he's so sexy and different. He heads up top, misses the swanton, Jericho pops up, hits the code breaker and wins. The IC title, it's a title change on this very episode of Raw. Oh my God, the last match might not have been a WrestleMania rematch, but this next one certainly is because believe it or not, we are going all the way back in time to WrestleMania 1. It's only the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov who come out and do the whole like, Iran number one, USA, like two. The crowd don't boo them as much as I thought they would. Maybe they're just genuinely quite pleased to see them. But uh oh, things are about to get spooky. Get your firefly lights out because it's time for Wyndham Rotunda. Oh, sorry, Wyndham and Wyndham and Rotunda. They're about to have this match, which I can't believe is actually about to take place, given the age of the men involved. But then here comes Gillian Hall to stop things in its tracks. Uh, she says, guys, I wasn't even born when the four of you had your match at WrestleMania 1. I'm like, all right, bragging. She wants to sing Born in the USA, uh, doing her terrible singing gimmick, of which I am familiar. Uh, and then she, <laughs> she starts to sing it, and Rotunda's like, no, enough of this. And he marches straight over, picks her up on his shoulders, and I genuinely think he's about to go F5, but instead, he just does an airplane spin. But it's not any airplane spin, it's actually very fast and vicious. And when he puts her down, she falls over and rolls out the ring. And that's it, that's the end of the segment. So no match, even though the, the disruption, Gillian Hall, has been dealt with. They're still not gonna go ahead with the match. I guess his airplane spin was so terrifying that the heels just forfeited, maybe? Backstage, Randall Randall Keith hypes up Kane ahead of his match with Triple H by getting really, really, yeah, really sensually close to his face. Really close, man. Kane isn't happy about this and really not so sensually, but depending on your preferences, actually, grabs Randy Orton by the throat. Why have I done that? Grabs him by the throat and says, you don't need to remind me. I'm about to pure batter Triple H. Triple H comes out and uh, there's a lot of signs in the crowd for Triple H, including a smock sign. Here we go. It's taking the mickey out of the wrestling. It says Triple H Warrior WrestleMania rematch because Warrior squashed Triple H at WrestleMania previously. No sold the pedigree and everything. It was a whole, it's weird to look back on. There's nothing really to report in this match. Like if you imagine Kane versus Triple H on TV with minimal stakes really, then that's exactly the kind of match they had. Just picture it in your brain now. That's what they're doing. There's a lot of, ah, knee, 
Runny Warbot. It's all very safe, very controlled, very professional. They are pro wrestlers. It's really paint by numbers until Orton walks. Oh, no, it's not. Triple H does his bump that I really like as well. The one where he gets thrown all the way over the corner to the outside. God, I'm very defensive about that bump there. I love that bump. Orton comes out to watch anyway and sees Triple H win with the pedigree. He's not too happy about this, but I know what the real question you're thinking is. Does Kane do the infamous Kane bump on the pedigree? Oh, you better believe he does. Look at that. Look at the state of that. It's one of the worst Kane bumps I've ever seen. Never change, Kane. Well, not in, not in some respect. So Triple H wins and we are on to the next match. The next match is another not WrestleMania rematch. It's the whole concept of the show, guys. This was originally meant to be a women's tag match between Ashley Massaro and Maria taking on Melina and Beth Phoenix, the women's champion at the time. But instead, because of an apparent injury to Ashley Massaro, it's just a singles match, Maria versus Melina. And at one point when Melina does her, you know, her sensual seductive entrance under the bottom rope, there's two lads in the background who are really going for it. They're like, oh yeah, and I'm like, oh boys, calm it down. I went Randy Savage there actually. I'm more hyped for Maria's entrance because I'm a little pop punk boy and Zebrahead was her theme music at the time, or Zebrahead as I guess it is correctly pronounced in America. In fact, here's a photo of me seeing them at a gig in Newcastle when I was 17 and I was having a wonderful little time with my friends. Look at that. Uh, don't know what happened to that jawline. Oh, that's gone. <sighs> It's gone. It's gone forever. Anyway, because Ashley is injured and because the women's division had no real respect given to it at the time, she's just replaced like for like with another woman. In this case, Candice Michelle. It's as if they're saying none of this matters. It's just another woman. She's in there now. Hooray. Candice and Maria get to the bottom of the ramp. They point backwards at the stage and the Playboy cover falls down. It unfurls from the rafters because Maria is on the cover of Playboy. Uh, the, <laughs> the Playboy cover gets pyro. So yeah, despite like three quarters of the roster not being worthy of pyro, Playboy cover, oh, 100% will set off some fireworks for that. I bet those two lads in the front row agree because then oh, 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 that's enough of that. The match goes on for like mere seconds until Santino Morella comes out with the copy of Playboy, the physical copy, the physical copy, not, not just on an SD card. He comes out with the magazine, he gets on the apron, he's cross because Maria is on the cover and he's her jealous lover. But at the same time, no he's not, because I'm sure earlier on, I was confused about this as well, I'm sure earlier on, it was in the storyline, I don't think, I think they've broken up is what I'm saying. They've broken up already. Even on commentary, they're confused. Lola goes, hang on, are they even together? What's going on? And JR very seriously goes, I do not know that information. <laughs> So my confusion from that Carlito video before, AKA the best part of this show by a mile, is totally valid. No one knows whether Maria or Santino are together or not. I guess it reflects real life. We all know a couple like that. Or maybe it's deliberately ambiguous storytelling like Mulholland to derive. Sam told me to say that. Melina wins the match heelishly after Santino distracts Maria by ripping up the copy of Playboy. No! Boys in the front row are like, no! After the bell, Candice Michelle tries to stop Santino from continuing to rip up the magazine. And apparently Beth Phoenix is really passionate about someone's right to rip up any piece of literature of their choosing. Cause she charges across the ring and flattens Candice with a, what I think was a genuinely stiff right hand. And I'm like, Beth, calm down. This storyline literally does, does not matter. At Mania, we would eventually get the tag match that was, I think, meant to happen on this night. Ashley and Maria against Melina and Beth Phoenix. Again, the heels won that match as well at WrestleMania, but at least Maria got to kiss Snoop Dogg afterwards, so who's the real winner? Um, now I'm not saying that Snoop Dogg isn't a suave man. Of course he is, famously so. One, two, three, enter the bow. But at the, but at the same time, But it was a really random direction for that storyline to go in, wasn't it? I would never have paired Maria and the, the Dio Double Jizzle together. Double Jizzle sounds really bad. Next up, here comes the money, money talks. Here comes the money, ching, ching, bling, bling, get the cheddar. You know about cheddar, that's my favorite cheese. I love cheddar, cheddar, my Mr. Cheddar. It's Shane McMahon's turn to be on the show. 
Yes, it's the cheddar enthusiast himself, Shane McMahon. He comes out doing his dance with his smug Shane McMahon expression on his face, which at the time, I remember it was a more innocent time. We thought that was just his character, didn't we? We didn't realize that it was actually his real deep feelings. Like, I'm very brilliant. He is here to officiate the weigh-in between Big Show and Floyd Mayweather. Big Show comes out on his own. Floyd comes out with his team of the aforementioned ginormous men around him. But they're all like different heights. And I know Floyd's quite a small guy, but one of these men, can you see, right? In the back corner of the ring there, there's a bloke in a black t-shirt. He is gigantic. He's a ginormous man. He might be as big as the big show. They never, I think, have them that close to each other in this segment because people might have seen and gone, hang on, he's bigger than the big show, him. And because he's dressed really plain compared to some of the other guys, the, the, the dude, when I saw him, when I first like consciously noticed him, my heart did a little like drop, like a little scared, like, oh no, <laughs> because I noticed how massive he was. And I believe that's hardwired into us because back in the days of, back in the wild, if we saw someone that big, we know to just take off in the other direction. What I'm saying is he activated my fight or flight response. Through a laptop screen as well, by the way. Like, it was, it was heavy. Floyd's getting heat from the crowd and he's playing off it well. He's glaring at them. He's really milking this heel roll, which is fair enough. They both do their weigh-ins. Big Show comes in at nearly three times the weight of Floyd Mayweather, which might be, I think it probably is a bit of an exaggeration, but crucially, only a bit of an exaggeration. I mean, look at them. Look at the difference. Big Show gets on the mic and goes, oh, I see you've brought your posse. Well, how about I bring out my posse? My turn, boys, gentlemen, if you will. And then the music that hits the speakers is the theme. It's, whoa, I'll never give in. I just wanna be, wanna be low. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Papa Roach, Big Show's posse. Sadly, tragically, it's not Papa Roach. It's just like assorted members of the Raw locker room. I'm really devastated by this. My weakness is I care too much. Big Show cuts a promo tearing Floyd Mayweather apart, saying no one likes you, none of the locker room respect you, not even your own bodyguards like you. They only hang around and protect you because you pay them. And at WrestleMania, I'm gonna make sure you can never box again. It's Floyd's turn to respond and he gets on the mic and he's getting like the full Stone Cold what treatment from the crowd, which forces him in a good way to slow his promo down. And he actually comes across a crumb... I was about to say he actually comes across quite coherently, which is heavily ironic, given that I've just <laughs> just botched that line. I'm so cross at myself. But yes, he comes across very well, um, I think, considering he's an athlete, not a, an actor or something, a celebrity more, more inclined to like speaking roles in wrestling. No, and he still comes across pretty well. But crucially, because he's got to slow the promo down to almost a poetic Shakespearean rhythm, he comes across also like a whimsical forest sprite. It's like he's a mystical creature speaking in riddle to our hero and our hero needs to work out what he's saying to move on in the storyline. And to make matters worse, he's got a roll of dollar dollar bills y'all in his hand and he keeps taking one out and he's meant to throw them at Big Show but Big Show's so big he kind of throws them upwards and they flutter majestically down to the canvas as if he's going, oh, look at this. And I'm like, this could not be more fairy tale if he tried. He says things like, well, it's true, you may hurt me. That's the WrestleMania. But Big Show, you must catch me first. I'm like, no, nah, this has to be a joke. Now I get the point, I know what Floyd's saying. He's, he's the greatest defensive boxer of all time, widely regarded to be anyway. And that means, you know, Big Show, yeah, if you, if you land one on me, it might hurt me, but at the same time, you're never gonna be able to because I'm too skilled. I get that's the point he's trying to make. But it sounds like he's saying, ooh, catch me in the forest, then I will answer your questions three. Big Show picks up some of the banknotes off the floor and hands them to the wrestlers around the ring, which makes WWE suck because their reactions are delighted. Kofi Kingston's mildly impressed. Look at Super Crazy, mate. He's buzzing. Floyd says he'll break Show's jaw at WrestleMania and everyone turns to leave. But before Floyd can get out of the ring, Show scoops him up and hurls him over the top rope onto some wrestlers on the outside and it all kicks off. There's pushing and shoving. There's there's Shane getting in the middle trying to keep the peace, but he gets knocked over. There's a woman in the crowd who screams consistently throughout. And I'm like, does she think it's real? And you know what? As far as segments like this go, it does feel quite real. As we all know, Floyd would go on to face show in this match, uh, WrestleMania 24, which is pretty universally well regarded. And I think probably, as I mentioned earlier, was the best WWE celebrity match before before all the celebrities became good at wrestling. I thought until about this year that wrestling was a hard thing to do, but apparently anyone can do it. 
take that, Lou says, and Nick Bockwinkle. You're all, <laughs> you're all rubbish. You're not as good as Bad Bunny if he can. <laughs> what am I doing? Edge versus CM Punk is up next. Again, not a WrestleMania rematch, but they were in the same Money in the Bank ladder match, which kind of counts, but really, really doesn't. Here comes Edge making his entrance, and here comes the man who changed the face of professional wrestling forever. Zack Ryder. Yes, Edge is out with the Edge heads, and then, oh, here comes Phil. He did a few things as well. This one's another short one. The, the matches in this episode were not the emphasis. It was very much all about storytelling, building feuds towards WrestleMania, not the action itself. So after a couple of minutes, Punk gets distracted by, I think, Ryder on the apron. Edge spears in, one, two, three, and Edge wins. Yonish day! Weirdly, despite this very straightforward loss, Punk would then go on to win the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 24, and then win the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 25. It's just a shame that those two wins would represent the very pinnacle of his career, and he wouldn't really go on to do anything else of note. I work with children. Next up, William Regal is out in a lovely suit, and his job is to be very smart, very British, and to hype the upcoming Raw vs SmackDown match at WrestleMania between SmackDown wrestler Batista and the Raw representative, and Regal says the thing, you manga. Here comes Umaga, and Regal cuts a big, bombastic promo. But then they're interrupted by the animal, Batista, who comes out looking like the biggest Slim Shady you ever have seen. Because he's dressed like Eminem. That's the joke. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ. I'm so tired. <laughs> oh, leave that in if you want. <clears throat> Right, no, we're gonna we're gonna shoot. The camera keeps breaking as I'm trying to do this video, and I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat now. Batista and normal service resume. Batista and Umaga have a little brawl back and forth. Batista hits the spine buster, and Umaga rolls out of the ring. He tries to get back in for an even bigger brawl, but all the referees swarm him and stop him. And Regal's there going like, "No, you manga, no, save it for war, get for WrestleMania." Batista wins at Mania as well. And finally, the main event of the evening. It's the rematch of WrestleMania 23. It's John Cena versus HBK. And it's good, obviously. They've got terrific chemistry together. In fact, there's a bit of the match early on that I really enjoyed, which shows how they've both been very studious boys. They've done their homework on each other because Cena goes for a leapfrog, so HBK just stops. And Cena goes like, plop. I think it's, it's clever. It's good psychology. The match is getting really, really good. It, it starts off okay, and then it warms up. And then now they're now they're countering each other's moves. They're struggling over submissions. Sean even does a springboard moonsault to the outside, and I'm like really enjoying it. And then Randy Orton runs in for the DQ. It was good while it lasted. Randy looks to RKO Cena onto an upright chair, but on the flat bit, not on the sticky up bit. He's not. Jonathan Moxley or anything. No, he goes for the nice flat part, but Cena reverses it and slams him back first onto the chair. Um, I think that's the end of the show because Cena's music hits, but instead Triple H pops up on the Tron with a few parting words. And I noticed it earlier, right, when he had his match, but I didn't say anything, but it's more obvious now. He's got the the long, he's got quite, even for Triple H, he's got long hair at this point. He's got the open jacket look going on, and he's also um, being very whimsical, like Floyd Mayweather was earlier. He's been drinking whatever Floyd was as well. Um, he's a bit like Adam Cole here. He's smiling a lot and being very smug. And the hair in the jacket, do we not see that? Like the Pokemon evolution of Adam Cole. Am I being sacrilegious? Anyway, Paul is here to reveal that next week he's going to be in charge of Monday Night Raw. This week we had Randy, last week presumably we had John Cena, next week it's time for Triple H. And he books, in very whimsical fashion as he says, Orton versus Cena against the entirety of the Raw roster. <laughs> Delightfully devilish, Seymour. It's a match that Cena and Orton actually win the next week, burying the rest of the Raw roster. Except they win by DQ, I suppose, and then they go on to WrestleMania and have that triple threat with Triple H. Orton retains with a big punt to the head. You can't argue with that. Even though it's a match that features three of the... Oh, that's the end of Raw, by the way. Even though it's a match that features three of the biggest names, arguably, in WWE history, it's a weird, only, like, semi-remembered part of WrestleMania 24. It's overshadowed by various other things from that night, like the main event between Edge and Undertaker, or like Floyd Mayweather versus Big Show, or especially, I guess, like Shawn Michaels retiring Ric Flair forever. Hmm. 
Overall, I don't think this was as weird as some of the weirdest episodes. Like, it was actually pretty entertaining for the most part. Although, as I mentioned, the emphasis was more on building stories and feuds towards Mania than it was the actual in-ring action. But as far as being sports entertained, I was moderately so. On the negative side of things, I would say the gimmick of it being a WrestleMania Rewind show didn't really work. I, I think, you know, most of the matches weren't even proper rematches from Mania, and even the ones that were didn't get much of a runtime. But one thing I am glad about is that this show gave me the chance to talk about it on camera in front of you lovely people. Just kidding, I'm just glad it brought Carlito versus The Seagull to my attention. Thank you for watching. I've been Jack from Cultaholic. Thank you to Luke for editing this video. Thank you to the camera for finally getting me to the end of this. And we'll see you very soon. Oh, real anger there at the end. Real, that was real.